All right, gang, Professor McElroy here, uh, May 2022 section of Multimedia Portfolio. I'm gonna go ahead and start the recording for week one, uh, learning module one, so we can kind of get the groundwork laid for our semester long or session long uh, multimedia portfolio. You may notice that it's GRA 2181. So this is an interactive PDF portfolio that you would use uh, when seeking an entry level design position, uh, any junior level graphic design positions uh, would be looking for a portfolio sample, uh, some kind of interactive PDF or online PDF, uh, something you can print out if you need to, but more than likely email to a potential creative director, marketing manager, uh, some hiring manager looking for a creative uh, to add to their team of designers. 2000 level, we're talking about an entry level designer. We're talking about a junior graphic designer, someone that has up to one year of experience. And by one year of experience, I mean, they've been using the software for a minimum of one year, producing uh, professional level design pieces. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean out of school one year. It just means showing the aptitude to be a creative using the software for a minimum of one year. So this is a really great class for building a standardized, shareable online portfolio. Now, if you're a bachelor level student and you're continuing on with three and 4,000 level classes, you'll be building a portfolio website. You'll be taking it one step further and you'll be creating an online experience of four or five pages combined with a bunch of case studies of design pieces uh, to enter into the design world as a graphic designer, not a junior graphic designer. So there is a difference. Junior graphic design, they're not really looking for that much software experience, just an aptitude for being creative with some basic technical ability. When you push yourself into three and 4,000 level classes, you push yourself from a two year environment or AS environment to a bachelor's environment, that's when a solid amount of software application is required. But you're talking about taking a job that's in the 32 to 35 range and push it into the 45 or 50 range. I mean, there's a big difference, software application and software understanding. When you get into the two, three year usage, heavy usage of the software, you're talking about someone that can join a team and just do part of a project. At the 2000 level, you're looking to join a company and a marketing team where you're supporting, helping, guiding in the development of design pieces, not actually in most cases, getting pieces yourself and running with them. So there is a difference based on the years of experience. Now there's always an exception because there's always students that gravitate to the software, do extremely well, really push their skill set, and they have a three and 4,000 level knowledge of software entering completing a 2000 level education. So just know that's kind of how the buildup is, the kind of ladder, I guess you'd say, in the design world for climbing that ladder. Obviously a little bit more education, a little bit more software application, a little bit more development of portfolio will enter you in at a different point than someone who hasn't had as much touch point with the software. So you may notice a lot of content is embedded in the learning module. Learning module one has videos I've recorded. It's got some uh, detailed analysis of student portfolios and professional portfolios. There's a lot of content. There's PDFs, there's templates, there's all kinds of stuff. The reason that is, is because this is often delivered as an online environment because it's a multimedia portfolio. So that's why there's so much stuff in it. So each week as a TEC format, I'm gonna be talk about, talking about analyzing and directing you for your portfolio development. The templates are there, the videos are there, everything's already recorded for you. I'm gonna spend the time analyzing the good, the bad and the ugly as it pertains to portfolio development. So that when you're building your pieces each week, you have a clear clarity of direction as it relates to building a personal brand, building your initial case studies, making this real world application come to life so that you can put your best foot forward in a portfolio environment. Also notice and know that this is a template. Portfolios are constantly changing. I've been designing for 25 years now. Every week, month, few months, 
I add different pieces to my portfolio. I'm a working designer, just like you guys dream to be, right? So I'm always updating mine. I'm changing mine. I'm tweaking mine. Since my graduating year, 25 years ago, I've probably had three different personal brands. I've evolved my brand as my creativity evolved. So just know that what we create in here isn't set in stone. It's just a template, a process, a rationale for developing a portfolio. You don't have to fall in love with all the pieces, but you have to make sure they're set up in a way that as you mature as a designer, you can replace them, right? Because you're going to get better. You're going to learn more. You're going to evolve as a thinker. Your creative aptitude, how you do things, everything's going to evolve. What I hope to do at a 2000 level portfolio is to give you a template for that thing to evolve. Maybe if you wanna do some freelance work and you just wanna share some design pieces with a potential client, this portfolio is a perfect template for it. Maybe you wanna start some part-time work working at an agency or get an internship or shadow or start your first job in design while you're still in school. An interactive PDF is an excellent format combined with a resume in order to start that process of dream job seeking. You have to put together your skill set, your knowledge of software, your aptitude for design in a tactile physical thing. Managers don't understand oftentimes what you know, how you do it, because they don't do it. They're just hiring for it. So they need to see your process, what you know, how you do it. So the portfolio is very much broken into vector skill sets, raster skill sets, packaging design, web design, the different things that a potential employer or client would want to be able to see so that they can envision what they're looking for fitting into what you've already created. So they want to be able to see that you have the technical ability and the skill set to create what they envisioned based on what they see in your portfolio, right? So we want to have a bunch of different touch points in our portfolio template so that we fit a lot of people's potential desires. Your portfolio is never going to cover everything. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. Sometimes I have some multimedia solutions in it. Sometimes I have other. I can't possibly touch every media outlet that designers do, because we do all kinds of stuff. But I want to show my ability, my creativity, and my style, I guess is the best way to put it, my style for design, my brandability of design. I want to put that in a portfolio so a potential employer or client can see exactly what I do, how I do it, and what it looks like. Designers all design differently. They all have a different skill set. They all have a different aptitude. And just because your style of design does not fit into one industry doesn't mean it doesn't fit into another industry. So don't think you as a creative professional will fit in all jobs. That isn't a true statement either. Designers design based on what their innate style ability is right? So that doesn't fit every industry. So students will come in and be like, I want to be an interior designer. I want to create websites for an architectural firm. I want to do things in this particular industry. And when they get into it and learn the software and start designing, they realize their creative style may not fit that industry, right? There's a designer for everyone. We're trying to create a portfolio that fits so that you can show what you can do technically and creatively, but also know that your style will fit into a style. Uh, we had a recent graduate, beautiful design sense. She was really good. Um, she had one idea when she started in school. She was a painter. She liked to do tactile things. And her first job was Chico's. So it was kind of fashion kind of thing, but she could draw. Um, she liked illustrators. She liked branding. And she's gone from Chico's to Soma now. I've had other designers come in that thought they wanted to be CAD designers and they're working for uh, a Whole Foods now or J.J. Abrams Beverage Distrib Distribution Center. That's the place that delivers all the beer to all the restaurants. You know, they have a graphic designer in-house. That person was a student here and he thought he was gonna do something totally different. But when he got done with his education, he realized he really enjoyed event designing, the things that JJ Abrams does to support the brands of Budweiser, uh, 
Miller Lite, all the different beverage brands. And he was able to design signage, make e-announcements, design billboards, vehicle stuff, all based on the fact that he had a design degree, he knew how to use the software, and he understood the industry. So just know this portfolio is going to evolve. Everyone's like, I want to build this particular type of portfolio. You, the most important thing is to build a brandable thing that you can replace, build, adjust, manipulate over time. So just know that that's what this thing is for. Should it be majestic? Yeah. Should it look like you took the time, energy, and effort to build some really thoughtful things? And those thoughtful things could be things you started in class and you want to adjust, add it, add to, take away from, refine what you might have created in a previous class? Absolutely. So if you had, um, if you had a graphic design two or web design and there was something you did that you really loved, you can edit, adjust, manipulate that make changes to it, add to it, because you're going to see when we get into the actual project descriptions, oftentimes it requires building pieces in addition to, but you have some pieces to start with. So if you were good at organization or good at saving, you should have some pieces that you can start with and build on for this class. We are going to look for a professional level completed portfolio. Typically, it's a cover page about seven case studies or so to complete our booklet. We're gonna replace those pieces later as you have different projects, different assignments. If you're a bachelor student, we do design study class, which has multiple design solutions for a client. We've got a bunch of different opportunities to create things, but let's try to put together the best multimedia portfolio we can to start with. It's a lot easier to replace than it is to make new. So that's kind of our goal for the course. So you'll notice on the home page kind of gives you a basic description of the portfolio. I used to teach this class where we actually physically printed pages and made booklets and made things to hand out. Some people still like doing that. So they'll take our portfolio template and they'll make a postcard that they hand out at companies to companies that they think they would like to work for, or they take their designs from the multimedia portfolio and they end up making business cards and different things they could hand out in order to start kind of that job search. I had a physical black portfolio case. It was made by a bookbinding company in New Jersey. It had two latches. It was very heavy. I opened it up and it had 10 to 12 design pieces printed and mounted on black boards. I mean, it was very gallery style of portfolio. We've long gone by the wayside. Any student that's ever had class with me, anyone ever seeking a job, they've emailed this PDF to a potential employer and that's how it, they achieved their first job. Or they posted it up to an iCloud drive or some online platform where they could just email it to a, a potential employer. The printing days are over, even though I still have mine, it's in my home office. I use it kind of an art installation piece now. It's laying on a table, it's opened up and you can look through it. It's got packaging designs in it. He's got printed pieces, but everything nowadays has been digitized. So the idea of actually going to a marketing manager, a creative director, pulling out your portfolio and letting them flip through the boards, that's kind of gone by the wayside. So uh, now we do everything digitally. So we're going to talk about that format. I'm just going to crack the door open real quick. It's a little warm. What's going on? I think the fan stops working. So that is the bones, the foundation of multimedia portfolio. So let's get into it. Uh, so let's go down to the modules. The syllabus is standard. Each of you have had me before in class. I think there's two or three of you in here. All of you have a strong technical ability. You know the basics of Illustrator and Photoshop. You can use InDesign. So you have the foundation. This course is about pushing the level of completion making sure that your solutions are a full campaign, making sure your solutions have a depth of creativity, making sure your solutions in a real world situation hold up to professional level of completion. So if we're creating a logo, I wanna see a one color, a two color and a full color logo, not just a full color logo. If we're creating a, a packaging design, I wanna see the front and back of it. 
Like we need to make sure we're completing things to the level of completion we need to for professional output. Because any creative director, any marketing manager, anyone like that is looking for your understanding of the full level of design completion, right? So if we're doing a, a business card, I want to see front and back. If we're doing an identity package, you should also have an envelope and a letterhead. Um, if we're doing uh, a website mock-up, which you've done in web class, you should have at least two pages, two screenshots of it. And not only two screenshots of it, you should have a photo of a computer and it should be placed in the computer screen so it looks like it's real. So when we're building the portfolio, we want these to be real world, real life, installation mock-ups, which means if it's a business card, we want to digitize the image to make sure it's laying on a table, right? So we get a photograph of a blank business card on a wood table, and we mock your design up on the business card. Portfolios are the most powerful when you see them in real world life. That's why I printed a portfolio so that they could page through it and see actual physical mock-ups of the design pieces. Now everything's interactive, right? Everything's interactive. They don't need to physically touch it, but the image online that they see of it, they want it to appear real, right? Appear like it's a real thing. So Duffy is an agency that I really love. So I'm just gonna open it up really quickly because Duffy is out of Minneapolis and they do a wonderful job of doing digital mock-ups of their work. So I'm gonna go into their portfolio real quickly, just so that you can get a sense for their mock-ups, where they create things and design them and digitize them in a way for real world installation. Sometimes they're photographs, sometimes they're done digitally. Beautiful samples of design that are done. Here are the labels, here are the bottles, and here's the description of what they did, right? This is a really beautiful case study of the challenge and the solution. So just be thinking about that in, por in portfolio world. If I ask you to design one week, a series of three billboards for an aquarium. That's the challenge. The solution is how you solve it, what images you use, what your concept is. That should drive your portfolio. So this thing shouldn't just be three billboards slapped digitally into a photo and placed in one of the pages of your portfolio. Next to it should be a small write-up of the concept. I used Photoshop. I think the way to highlight an aquarium is to show beautiful images of animals. I like the colors blue because it's an aquarium and it's water-based, right? You wanna make sure that you're writing up and giving a solution and approach to what you're doing. Sometimes you'll have a, a job opportunity and you'll email them a link to or an attachment of your portfolio and they will look at it at a later date. They're not gonna look at it while you're talking to them. So you wanna make sure that your portfolio shows and tells what the concept is that you're creating. I always like to say, this was created in Photoshop. These images are high resolution and I got them from X. My design concept is Y, right? These are, well, what is the project? They are billboard designs. So a billboard campaign using Photoshop with images from X with the concept of Y, right? You want to make sure that you are telling the client, imagine they don't understand what you do. They know they need a graphic designer, but they don't have any idea what a graphic designer does. Actually, that was my first job. I was hired from an engineering, I was hired by an engineering firm and the actual hiring manager in the interview said, we're going to pay you X because we know we need you, but we have no idea what we're gonna do with you. They literally told me that in the interview, you're gonna show up and we're gonna start making things, but we have no idea exactly what we need you for. And within one year, I had doubled my salary and they started outsourcing me to other engineering firms who did not have a designer. 
So they knew they needed someone very smart on their part. They hired me, secondly, smart on their part. And number three, they figured out what designers did and how it related to their industry. So when you're building a portfolio and you need to make sure there's at least a little bit of a write-up combined with our images so that if someone looks at it later and they don't know anything about design, you're telling them the basics, who the client is, what the software is, what the project is, and a little bit about your idea. Like, what is your concept? Because most hiring managers, if you've ever looked at a job description on Indeed or Monster or any of those, they write everything they could possibly imagine a designer would ever do. The description has 18 software applications. It covers every gambit of what a designer is. Half the time they use two different classified ads and they paste them together. They have no idea what they're doing. They have absolutely no idea. Sometimes they even use the wrong terms in the description for actually what they're looking for. They're just copying job description, pasting them together. It's an HR manager. It's a marketing manager. It's someone who doesn't know what design is per se. So you want to make sure that the portfolio, as we develop it, tells them exactly what a designer does, what software they're using, what the concept is, and what the client challenge is. And that way, anyone with zero background can say, I like that. I think I need that in my business. I want to talk to person A, B, or C. So that's the pitch I'm going to give you from that standpoint. If you ever want inspiration, go to Duffy.com. They are genius at showing you what a design is, what the challenge is, what the solution is, and they package it in a way that's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's a really beautiful website and it's changed over the years and it's never changed in a way that wasn't really good. I mean, they're really good at it. So just keep this in mind as you're creating your portfolio that this is kind of the bar we want to kind of reach for. So if we have a label project, you want to find a few beautiful photo of a potential package that you could put your logo on. This is Photoshop work. You can just slap your logo right onto a white label and it would look like this, but the picture's beautiful, right? You want to capture this in a way that someone can visualize your, because we're not making this stuff, right? In most cases, your portfolio as a student isn't things that were physically made. I offer up a lot of internships and design opportunities as they come across my desk to different students. And those are real projects, but in most cases, students don't necessarily have a portfolio full of real things. They have, they have class projects, maybe they have personal projects that they just have always wanted to make. They draw and they created some things that they wanted to put on a t-shirt, right? Normally students, especially at the 2000 level, don't necessarily have projects that they created that are professional. Many do because they have a family friend or a business, someone they know, and someone needs something designed, a flyer, maybe a, an update to a menu or a logo or a business card. Lots of students have things that they just stumble upon while they're learning that they could use. But just know that even if it's for educational purposes only, and if you go to LinkedIn or you go any of the social media platforms, it's full of students' work that doesn't really exist. It's just educational projects and there's zero wrong with that. You just wanna make sure you wanna put your best foot forward as you're showing those, right? This was a project I did for a uh, packaging design class, or this is a project I did for advertising design class, or this was my graphic design one class and this is the logo I drew, right? So you just wanna frame it in a way that looks professional so that the employer can visualize you doing that for them for real life, for things that are actually made. So Duffy's a really great place to look. Okay, so let's jump into uh, the learning modules themselves. You'll notice we don't have a book for this class. I used to have little portfolio books that had little case studies and different things in them, but I quickly realized recording students' samples, recording real world solutions, sharing links, sharing photographs, just showing you what the bar was for what you're trying to finish, to complete, to design was way better than a book that gets outdated three months after it's printed. The unfortunate part is design is like ever changing, ever evolving. The software is ever changing, ever evolving. So even if it's a 2022, by two months into 2022, there's already something I would consider much cooler out there or 
you can't cover every industry. So the book covers a bunch of stuff, but it isn't an industry you're interested in. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. So it's nice not to have a book and use open resources at times. And this is a really great class for it. I try to put as much in the announcement section for inspiration, things you create, things that I think are good to inspire you. But each of you in the class, I've had you before, you have technical ability. So now we just wanna make sure that even at the 2000 level, we're producing something that would validate an entry level position in design if you were to share it with someone. So that's what we're talking about. Okay, so uh, open resources, videos I recorded, announcements, images I share, all that good stuff. Uh, each week I'm gonna lecture for probably an hour or so, maybe a little bit longer, just going over the expectation of the project for the week, highlight the things that make them strong, talk about what it should look like when it's done, and talk about the portfolio as a whole as it evolves. You'll actually probably notice that there are a few submissions each learning module, and it's a adding to the portfolio process. So the first week, first learning module, you're going to give me, in essence, page two and three in your portfolio book. The next time you submit, you're going to give me page maybe four, five, and six. That doesn't mean you don't give me page two and three. It just means we're building upon our portfolio as we build studies. And it's really important to give that to me each time we submit, because both you and I can see the evolution of your portfolio, see where the strengths are, see where maybe the weaknesses are, see where we can make it better as we evolve. So does that mean maybe something you create week two, I want you to retouch week three as you're creating something because I think the week two submission could be a little bit better as we evolve week three. Yes, this thing is going to evolve over the four weeks. So if I critique something or give you guidance for something, it's a strong recommendation that you should make the update. Remember, this portfolio is liquid. It's ever-changing. It's ever-evolving. It's kind of growing as you grow. Week four, you might go back and say, boy, I need to make an edit to my master template because I want to add X, Y, or Z. I expect you to do it. Do you have to resubmit the week one? No, but you'll get better and your projects will get better week two, three, and four, and you'll see an evolution of your portfolio. If I'm critiquing, it's to make it better as it evolves. This is an evolving thing, but I want you to put your best foot forward. And I say that with the greatest love. I've had students get world-class jobs while they were still in school. Why? Because they took the time to be very sensitive to the level of detail that was required to show, even though I'm still in school, I can do what you ask. I can make changes, edit, get better, grow, and be part of a team positively. So just because you're in school doesn't mean you can't be a professional designer while you're learning, because you can. There's lots of opportunities out there to be everything from the graphic designer at the local print shop. Students aren't done with school when they get those jobs. A lot of print shops hire designers as they're learning once they have the basic technical ability, right? That's a really great entry level job. It's fast paced, you're designing things quickly, you're creating professional work and you're learning the process of interacting with a client. Swing that pendulum forward and you can go from there to Hertz designing all of their social media campaigns, editing their website, building point of purchase designs for their uh, rental car stands. I mean, the pendulum swings. There's lots of places you can go even while you're in school once you have the basic technical ability to start professionally designing while you're in school. So that would be a really great goal if that's a goal that you have to be working in field a little bit while you're still in school. The options, the opportunities are there. So you want to make sure the portfolio is up to the level of what you would like if you were job seeking right now while you're in school. Many students go from two to the 3000 level courses and continue on. And I think that's a really smart thing. In today's day and age, having more technical ability separates you from the group of potential hires that have less technical ability. Some fields that isn't as important, but I do believe in design, it's pretty important. The more years of touchability in the software you have, the more it separates you from the potential pack 
of those looking for your next dream job. And also remember that many, many, many jobs in design are totally remote now. I mean, if you go on Indeed and you do a job search for graphic design, you're gonna see about 200 jobs. And I would say 150 of the 200 are completely remote and 25 of the other 50 are hybrid. I mean, this field is a field where interacting online is a beautiful thing. So an online portfolio is a beautiful thing. A uh, PDF that we can share is a beautiful thing. So just kind of keep that in mind as we're evolving here and creating. Make sure you do your student introductions. You know me, Professor McElroy, that's my information there. Uh, like I said, no book, standard portfolio. Uh, we're gonna jump right into learning module one, which is all about branding. This is where the portfolio process starts. We have to brand something, personal brand, right? The Kardashians are masters of personal brands. What actual skill set do they have? I'm not quite sure. Honestly, I'm not quite sure. And there's like nine kids and they're all millionaires, but they are the masters of personal branding. Yeah, they got a cool name. I wish I was a Kardashian, right? They have a cool name, but they're really good at branding. What you perceive them to be in photos, in social media, in real life, honestly, probably isn't who they actually are. Yes, they do the behind the scenes with the Kardashian show or whatever, but you know, a lot of times they edit most of that too. They cut out the arguing, the fighting, the natural aspects of being a human being, the dynamics. They remove that and make it artificial. They are the masters of personal branding. I tell every student, you should have a LinkedIn account. You should start professionally networking. You should share things you're proud of that you're creating in class. LinkedIn's a great environment because it's a professional social media application. If you have one, find me and I'll like and connect with you, follow you, because it's a great way to have access to the hundreds of people I'm networked with. Students always ask, well, how do I learn? How do I meet people? Social media, LinkedIn, professional applications are a really great place to start. Uh, chambers, mixers, things you see where just like-minded people are hanging out. Really great place to start. So just think about that. So week one is all about personal branding, creating your name in a textual way. Some students think of personal branding in like a personal uh, design idea they have. Like I wanna open my own personal design business and I think I wanna name it X. Personal branding could be, you know, your visual of your design. Uh, mine's Maven Graphics. That's the name of my business. It's been the name of my business for 25 years. Uh, everyone that sees me sees that because that's my personal brand. I don't use Chip. I don't use McElroy. I use my personal brand, which is my design business. I've had it many, many years. It actually started as New York Street Design because that's the street I lived on. I was still a college kid and I made my own design business. And I actually designed for a modeling agency that owned the house I rented. And so they gave me rent for free to design stuff for them. So I immediately figured out I really love design because I can barter what I don't wanna pay for by just doing design work that is fun to me. So even while I was in school, I did, I designed church logos. Uh, I designed posters for, uh, uh, bands that were playing at local venues. Like I just started doing things, but I did it under a name called New York Street Design. Now it's Maven Graphics for me. And it's been that for 20 years. The first couple of years while I lived in the house, uh, I had the old name and then it evolved into the new name. So personal branding is about uh, making a visual mark representation that you would like to showcase your skill set under. Lots of students use their name, uh, Joe Smith Design or Joe Smith Creative or just Joe Smith, the graphic designer, right? There's nothing wrong with using your name and just saying who you are. Uh, some get kind of fancy and tricky with it and they're like, Joe Smith, visual communicator, right? They do all these kind of funky little terms for graphic design, digital designers, right? There's lots of ways you can personally brand. Just know that you do need a personal brand. Maybe it's just your first name. Maybe it's your initials. Maybe it's first and last name. Maybe it's just your last name. Maybe it's a fictitious name that you always out of box thinking, right? There's always something students are thinking of. That's why they're in the industry learning what they're learning because they like being creative. But the portfolio needs a brand. The best way to start with branding is to do something called a self-assessment. So the very first project in this class is to do a self-assessment. And actually each of the first two submissions are found in the reading and resources section. The self-assessment 
which is right here. It's a PDF. You can fill it out digitally. You can print it out and fill it out if you want to. You can place it in Illustrator and use the pencil tool and write right over the top of it, whatever you want to do. It's just an analysis of what you like, what you're comfortable in, the software applications, the basic things that you think you want to do. It's kind of the beginning. It's kind of like a, I think they give it in high school now. Take this test and it's going to tell you what job you would be good at, right? That's not what this is, but it definitely helps to get you kind of starting to focus on how much experience you have, what you like to do, the industries you're interested in. So the very first thing this week is to fill out the self-assessment. You can take a photo of it. You can save it as a PDF again, whatever you want to do to give it to me. Some students print it out, fill it out with a pencil, take a photo with their phone and upload the JPEGs. Some students download the PDF, bring it into Illustrator, type the answers over the top of it, resave it as a PDF whatever works best for you. But the self-assessment should be done first, right? The self-assessment should be done first. That leads us to project number two, which is the dream job paper. Now, this is really important, so don't phone it in. The self-assessment's important because we start to see what parts of design you like, how you consider your, your ability to be at this time, and what industries you might be interested in. The dream job paper is an opportunity to find 10 job descriptions. You can go to Indeed and type in web design. You can go to Indeed and talk, type in animator. You can go to Indeed and type in graphic design. And even in each one of those, there will be multiple jobs that are listed under there. I want you to take 10 separate job posts and answer the questions on the dream job paper. There's a series of questions. What technical ability do you need? How many years of experience do you need? What industry is it in, right? These two things are really important as we develop our portfolio because it gives you a focus area to start thinking about what this portfolio should look like, how it should evolve and what it should be. So those are your first two assignments. So don't jump to three or four without one and two. Start with the assessment go to the dream job paper, and then we go from there, okay? Very simple projects, but they do take a couple of minutes. The self-assessment, you could fill it out in five minutes, but be honest, be detailed, be true. Try to really take a look at it and think about it for a minute while you're filling it out because I always get all kinds of answers across the board about different things. And I like reading that because I get a little insight into what your brain's thinking, right? So digital portfolio self-assessment checklist is a really good place to start. Dream job paper is an awesome place to start because I get to see what you envision the dream scenario to be in your creative professional life. And sometimes it's game designer. And sometimes it is, uh, I want to work from home on a, a houseboat in Seattle, and I wanna work for an ad agency, right? You really quickly start to see what students envision as the industry, the skill set, the requirements, uh, the, the wish list, all the things. And at a 2000 level portfolio, it really starts to push you to then focus yourself on things that you want to get better at in order to reach those dream job opportunities. And they can happen very quickly if you're focused and targeted and you learn and apply what you learned in a way that puts your best foot forward. So just know those first two things are really important. The self-assessment, take you 10 or 15 minutes to fill out, not a big deal. The dream job paper, take you probably an hour to find 10 job descriptions. Don't pick the first 10, like actually dig through and be honest that these are 10 things I really would like to do. I have students to copy and paste the first 10 job descriptions that post up Indeed when they type in the word designer. And it may not even be what they dream of ever doing. I didn't know you wanted to be an interior designer. Oh, it was one of the jobs that po popped up. So I just copied and pasted it. No, take the time to find 10 jobs. Maybe Amazon is a place you would really love to design. Maybe you wanna work at Nike. You think it's awesome and you wanna design packaging for shoes. I mean, there are so many awesome things out there. Just make sure you take the time to find 10. Don't give me one and answer the 10 questions or seven questions. I forget how many questions. Sometimes I add and take away from the questions, but make sure you find 10 different ones. You can copy and paste it right out of the internet when you find it. Add a link to the job, 
paste the job description and type in the answers. If you just copy the questions over and over again with the job post above it, it makes it really easy, right? And it's a Word document, so just copy and paste it and plug your things in. I actually take the time to read every single dream job paper. A, I have each of you in class all the time, so I like to see where your brain is taking you. And B, I wanna be able to help you. Like if you have a desire to do a certain thing, I wanna know that when you're designing projects in my class that your end goal is something like X or Y. I also wanna know if someone contacts me that has an opportunity that would be a really great starting place for that area you're interested in, I know to reach out and share it with you, right? Every single week I get people calling me asking for students to help them with something. I had a meeting at Hodges today and someone that works here said, oh my gosh, I meant to, I wanted to come talk to you. Do you think a student would like to do X? And I'm like, I get this like three days a week. I mean, literally people are asking me all the time. If you have the interest in that area and the desire to create something, it's an awesome portfolio opportunity. So don't phone these two things in. And that's my last pitch for not phoning these two things in. Just make sure that you take the time. Now, you'll notice there's two more files in the attachment section of 1.2 Reading and Resources. The first one is the portfolio template. And I'm actually gonna click it and download it just so that I can open it in uh, InDesign. Cause you're gonna notice it is an InDesign template. Now, I'm just gonna zoom out and I'm gonna talk about this in a formatting way, but keep in mind, there's lots of programs out there that you can build a portfolio in to look and feel like this. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in design. I'm just gonna say that as a preface because there are many design programs that are multi-page image-based that has a text tool that you can compose some really beautiful por portfolios in. InDesign just happens to be the multi-page program that most designers feel most comfortable with if they're doing multiple pages. Now, you're gonna quickly notice a couple of things about the template. There is a cover page. Page number one, we won't be touching till the end of the class. This is in essence, your book cover to your portfolio. Well, we can't really do the book cover till we know the contents inside. So page number one, we're not even gonna to touch until we get the end of the semester. Page number two and page number three is where we're gonna start the exploration of our portfolio. You're gonna notice a few things. One is that this template is set up in a landscape environment. Things are most beautifully displayed for a design environment in widescreen. That's why Macs have a widescreen format. That's why when you go to the movies, it's a nice widescreen screen. Landscape, 16 by nine widescreen is a really beautiful way to display your imagery, your concepts, your design solutions. It also gives you a lot of horizontal space when you're creating things that are elongated in your portfolio. So no matter what program you settle on, and it doesn't have to be in design, I would probably recommend it unless you really love a different program. I've had students create their portfolio, literally laid it out in PowerPoint. And it's not that you can't do that, place pictures, place text, make a really beautiful landscape book. So there are programs out there. I'm open to other things, but portfo this portfolio template's a really good place to start from a design standpoint. So that's why I'm gonna break it down and explain it to you. And you can lean on this template and it evolve over time. Or if there is another program you love, I would be open to it as long as it looks like the finished product of what we create in the InDesign template environment. So you'll also notice it's facing pages, which means page two and three touch. The reason that is, is because you're gonna notice this little name up here says case study. This is the client name that all of the designs for this spread are associated with. So week one, it's actually your personal logo and personal swag. Personal logo on page two, personal, design swag on page three. When we get to billboards, it's gonna be billboards designs on page four, real world mockups on page five. So everything's gonna be created in a two page environment. The beauty about InDesign is you do a file, Adobe PDF, 
export and you give me the whole book in one click of the button. Just make sure that as you export your PDF each week, you name it uh, Joe's Portfolio Week 2, Joe's Portfolio Week 3, just so that you're not saving the name Joe's Portfolio over and over again, because sometimes students get confused and they start giving me the wrong portfolio in the wrong week. So just know as we build this thing, make sure you're naming it in a way that you can track it as you upload it. If you're really good and you're in the right week every week, you can just name it your portfolio and your last name because each week you'll be giving it to me and there won't be a save overlap because you're finishing each project each week. If you get a little bit behind, you might get confused and start giving me things out of sequence as we're building them. So then that's the case where you wanna make sure you name it to each your last name, portfolio, and the week or the project that we're working on just so that you can stay organized with it. Now, the portfolio template is very simple. It is set up in a master page environment. So you're gonna notice in the upper left-hand corner of the left page of the spread, it is the client name. That's why it is a space holder of case study. You're gonna notice that the template has your name, your email, and I like to give it some placement, like a city state. It doesn't necessarily have to be city state. It could be your name, your email address, and region, location, that sort of thing. But it does ground an online contact point. I'm not a fan of phone numbers, so we don't do that. But an email address, your name, and some regional grounding, just to give them a general idea of your design region, because even though it's online, sometimes there's remote opportunities and sometimes there's physical opportunities. And if you say uh, Southwest Florida or Florida or Naples, Florida or whatever, if it's a local job, they're gonna say, oh my gosh, this kid is local. We're gonna bring him in and we're gonna talk to him about the job we have. You're gonna notice there is an empty container in the lower right-hand corner that is for your personal branding. So when we create any kind of personal branding, we're gonna place it in this area of your facing page environment. And you're gonna notice there's a space holder for page number. This should be filled out as your personal template in week one when you complete your personal branding. Your booklet should have a master template set up. Now, when we get to like week four, we may introduce some background elements inside of your master template to dress up the portfolio a little bit, maybe textures, colors, something to kind of finalize the book, give it a magazine quality of layout that you're sharing online as a PDF. But from week one, we're looking for personal branding marking, basic contact information, numbering, and the client study name. Now, you know from InDesign, that the master template drives every single page. You should also notice or know, if you don't remember, that when you're in any given page of your portfolio, you can override the master template and make changes inside the individual pages. So like the master template says case study, but when you get into building your booklet, you're going to want to make this the name of the client for the case study you're working on. So know the template is for all of the master elements. But remember, you will have to customize a little bit inside each case study when you're actually building your case studies, right? You're going to have to make some modifications there. This thing is going to evolve from one study to two studies to three studies to four studies, right? So it's only three pages because it's the cover to your portfolio and the first case study. Case study two will be pages four and five. Case study three will be pages six and seven. The reason we use InDesign or an application like InDesign is because you wanna make sure every case study is consistently the same in layout so that we have a consistency of application, right? When you open up a magazine, all the titles for the article, the page numbers, the author of the article, the month of the issue, the name of the issue, that's all in the exact same place on all pages. Portfolios are the same way. They wanna feel like they're one page of a whole, one spread of a whole. 
The reason that's important is because if you submit this thing to a big company and they have a marketing department and they print your portfolio out and they hand it to all the members of the team, the members of the team aren't going to get every page. The members of the team are going to get the pages that relate to the job they do. So you want to make sure your name and branding is on each case study so that if one employee gets pages two and three and another one gets four and five and another one gets six and seven, another one gets eight and nine, they all know it's the same potential candidate, employee, hire that they're looking at the same portfolio. That's the reason why websites have a master template, right? Every page kind of looks the same. The content's just different on the page is because they want to make sure that it, when you are in a website, that you know you're in the same website on every single page. There's no difference in concept. This is just what originally was a printed book that has now evolved into an interactive PDF, that it has the same look and feel of the traditional elements of something that's printed now made into a digital environment. Very simple template, but can be very detailed, dynamic, unique, like really beautiful based on your skill set, your interests, your portfolio, your case studies, all of those things. So that is the template that we're going to be used format wise for multimedia portfolio. You can make your own adjustments, you can use your own skill set, but I want to make sure that everything has a cover page, everything is a two page case study, and everything is built sequentially based on a standardized template, right? And designs a great program for it. There's other programs out there. If there are other ones you explore, just know that that's the format I'm looking for. And each week I should get a submission with additional pages as we evolve the portfolio. Now, you're going to notice the next file. So we covered self-assessment. We covered dream job paper. We covered the basic template. Now, here's a PDF of the starting of what this build looks like when you're building a portfolio. Now I separated all these pages just so that you can get an idea. Well, this is a personal brand. This is actually one of the students I had in class that had this kind of funky name that they had been toying around with, a combination of their first and last name that they wanted to use as a personal branding mark. And this is what they evolved from in their personal brand of their template. Now, when I scroll down, you're gonna see what one student chose as a personal brand matchstick design, one color, one color, two color, full color, business card front and back, envelope, letterhead, and page three is their logo applied to what we would call merchandising swag, a t-shirt, a matchbook, which is really clever, a skateboard deck, just ways to brand their personal portfolio in a way that starts the page off on the right foot. And you'll notice page two of their portfolio started with the case study name, personal branding. Your page two should say personal branding or personal identity or professional business or design studio the things that you consider yourself as part of a learning, evolving, creating designer. I don't have to go any further in this PDF because that's where we're starting week one. But take a look at the layout of this. Scale, proportion, overlap, placement of elements so that it is a beautiful thing as we start building it. Look at the rotation and scale of this. Look at the overlap. The elements aren't the exact same size. They're not stacked in a grid. They're laid out in a way that feels real, feels organized, feels a level of visual separation, visual higher. And I say this, and the first student is going to give me a swag with three images in a grid box and they don't do any visual hierarchy. They don't make one thing bigger than the other. They don't scale anything down. Everything's the exact same size and it's laid out in a very simple format. I'm looking for the pages to evolve professionally like they would look if it was a magazine layout, if it was Duffy's case study, right? We wanna make sure that we not only know how to create a logo and illustrator, we know what it would look like if we wanted printed on a shirt. 
We know what it would look like if we made a two-sided business card. We know that it needs to be one color, two color, and full color, right? We know these things. We want to make sure that we showcase them in a way that we show both technical ability and the understanding of professional application. This project alone is like an eight-hour project. It's hard to brand yourself, and I understand that. And people will email me nine different questions about, well, do you think this is good? Does this make sense? Is this cool, right? If you're a little bit nervous about it, just start with your name. Joe Smith, graphic designer. Knowing that Joe Smith is the brand and graphic designer is the tagline, the job, right? whether it's design or graphic designer or web designer or creative thinker, whatever that tagline is. The name Joe Smith should be bigger than the word graphic designer, right? That's the very first beginning part of branding. The name, the thing you want to remember is bigger than the support statement or the tagline or the job that goes underneath of it. So if you're nervous about coming up with something catchy, coming up with something cool, coming up with something innovative, just remember that it can be as simple as just your first and last name or your last name and the word graphic designer under it, digital designer, creative thinker, artist. I mean, there's lots of names, web designer. There's lots of names to kind of focus your personal branding, but we can't build the portfolio until we have a personal brand to build on. Not only is it in the corner of the page right down here, not only is it going to be big on the home page because it's your portfolio, but it does also kind of set the tone for the style, right? Your own style is going to come out in how you write your name, what your personal brand looks like. But every portfolio starts with a personal brand. You got to kind of build that stage and then build it from there. So your personal brand is your weak one project. So let's take a look at the actual deliverables so we can talk about this. And remember, the week one deliverables are the first couple of pages of the portfolio. Remember, each week we're going to add to this thing. So the submission should come in in the PDF, not as individual case studies, but as a booklet that's evolving, right? Some students only give me page six and seven. Well, that's great, but I need to see one through five to make sure that the portfolio is evolving in a way that is beautiful, that is consistent, that showcases the best of what you have to offer. So don't give me just disjointed stuff. Give me the thing as a whole as you kind of create and evolve. 1.4 is the self-assessment. Fill it out, take a photo with your phone, scan it, fill it out digitally and make a PDF of it. Just make sure that you give me a digital copy of this. Don't stick it in my mailbox. Although I have had students over the years do that. Just take a picture with your phone. I mean, it's not hard and I can read it. Trust me, phones shoot at like 12 megapixels now. So I'm not really gonna struggle with the JPEG. So give it to me digitally. We're in a digital age. I need this thing digitally. Okay, dream doc paper. You can give it to me as a PDF. You can give me the Word doc filled out exactly based on the file in the reading and resources page, but do not phone this in. Make it 10 job descriptions. They can be all in Florida if you plan on working in Florida. They can be global if you envision yourself over the years working in Asia, but creating in California, I don't know, Colombia, right? There's all kinds of places you can be a graphic designer. That's the beauty about the job. It is global. And it doesn't even matter if you want to own your own business and work from home in your house in Tahiti, right? You can have global clients, but Give me the 10 or so job descriptions that fit the type of things you're interested in. And maybe that's not just one job title. Maybe that's, I'm thinking I might want to be a web designer, but I really love uh, packaging design. But I got this thing where I want to work for agencies and do a bunch of different jobs, right? So it doesn't have to be in a silo. It doesn't have to be all web design or all packaging design or all identity design or all whatever. You know, cover the basis of the things because it's really important that you understand what the requirements are for the job, right? That's the very first thing, qualifications. Number two is software application. Number three is maybe process, like what, what kind of style, what kind of thing are they looking for? Those are three things that jump out really quickly in a job description. 
years of experience, technical ability, software application, and style, right? Not everyone's going to work at Hallmark and, and design cards that have flowers on them. Not everyone likes to draw flowers, right? Not everyone wants to work at Nike because they love fashion. I don't really love fashion. My kids always give me a hard time because I buy whatever shoes work for whatever I'm doing, right? I like to run, I buy running shoes. They don't have to be pretty, they just have to be good for running, right? That wouldn't be my dream job, right? So make sure that you're taking a look at that and make sure you know exactly what kind of areas you're interested in. So don't phone that in because it really is a driving factor into the type of projects and the level of completion and what it looks like, right? If it's a certain industry you wanna work in, that industry has a style. And designers often start to design a little bit for that style, right? The student I was telling you who was the painter, she loved organic things. She ended up at Chico's because that's style, it's fashion, it's beautiful, it's textures, it's flowers. I mean, it's beautiful stuff. I wouldn't say that fits perfectly for the person who, you know, likes black and white and likes heavy metal music and creates very edgy things. That's not really a Chico's kind of designer, right? So the dream job paper will really help you focus on the style that the industry kind of is looking for that may or may not fit the kind of style that you like to create or do, right? You want to have a job where you're inspired every day. I've never taken a design job that I didn't go in the front door every single day thinking, man, I can't wait to make something today, right? Every day's different. Every day's unique when you're a graphic designer. Even when I was working on the same client for four months in a row, when I was working for the multimedia company, I'd literally work on one client's job for like three months. I mean, that's scary, right? 12 weeks to work on one job. But every day there was a different part of that job that I had to do that I really love. Sampling music, creating certain color palettes, certain animation. Maybe I was just photographing for the client to use in the animation that day. I always had something fun to do. So I never went into the door not excited to create something different for that day. So just know that the dream job paper will help you start focusing on that kind of thing. You're also going to notice that there are videos posted in every single learning module. That goes back to the fact that this is an online kind of sampling. I'm sharing things for you and it's best sampled, sampled by recording some desktop shares of things that I like, right? So everything has me talking through design choices, uh, design setup, right? You're going to notice, oh, I got to update this. I have a private video in there. Uh, I don't know why that went private, actually. So that should be a public video. So I got to go in and unlock that. Sorry about that. But I've posted videos to guide you through the process. But I want you to self-explore a little bit too, right? The portfolio is your baby. Yes, I can direct you through the best way to promote yourself, the best way to format, the best way to deliver, but it's your baby. Like this is your thing. This is your opportunity to make a visual resume. In essence, it's a visual resume, right? A visual resume. So you wanna make sure that it is your best foot forward, right? It's just like writing a resume. You would go to someone and help have them help you write your resume so that it highlights all your skills so you can get that dream job. A portfolio is just a visual resume. So you want to make sure you put your best foot forward. So I'm going to direct you in the formatting, the scale, the professional level of output, but some of it's going to be personal style. I love color and texture. So I'm going to start making case studies that have beautiful waves of color behind them, right? This is stylistic. Everyone's portfolio is different. Yours isn't going to look the same as anyone I've ever taught before. It is unique to you. I'm gonna be here to help you shape what that thing looks like as it evolves. And hopefully gives you a template to evolve from. If you're using InDesign, make sure your, all of your files are in one folder. You should have a folder on your computer, on your thumb drive, wherever you're designing that says portfolio or your last name portfolio. Every picture you take, everything you manipulate, every file you design, everything that is related to this multimedia portfolio needs to be in one folder. And if it's a project you created for a previous class and you're making edits to it, you're updating it, you're adding to it, that means you have two copies of that project. You have the copy on your computer from the class you did it in and a copy of the files that you're creating for your portfolio. And why is that important? 
because you're making modifications to that, you're updating it, and it's a timeline catalog of the client. This is what it looked like when I started, and this is what it looks like now. So everything in your portfolio should be uniquely new to the project you're working on at hand. If I Google or if I search my external drive, it's two terabytes and it's from everything I've ever created in my life, almost. I will see client projects that I started in 2001, I updated in 2010 and I redesigned in 2020. It's actually the exact same client because I've had them that long but I can actually go back and see the evolution of what I did for them. That's why it's important to always have a folder with the work at the time you are creating it. Also, it copyrights it. So if you have a digital stamp to the file you created, in essence, that's the same as printing the design out, putting it in an envelope and mailing it to yourself, which is what designers used to do. If they created a logo for a client and that client was using it professionally, Designers would actually print the logo out, put it in an envelope and mail it to themselves. And the stamping of the envelope was dating the copyright, right? So I actually didn't have to copyright the work. The client copy did the copyright, but by me mailing a copy of it to myself, it gave me the original ownership of the design. Well, we do that now with digital stamps. So if you designed a logo and you gave it to a client this year and in a year, you made some modifications to it and the client decided to use that thing beyond the usage. You actually could go back to the original creation of the logo and say, hey, that's my artwork. I created it in 2022. In 2025, you're still using it, but our agreement was for you to launch it for your brand and then we were gonna make changes to it, right? So I created it as a baby step for you now we're supposed to re-modify it and you're supposed to pay me for the modifications, right? If you do a digital stamp, then you have the ownership of the original artwork. I can't tell you how many times, not that it happens often for the small design shop, but it happens for the bigger design studies is that they actually go to court with a digital stamp of the original artwork. And they say, look, this was my art. They took it and they modified it. It happened just a year or so ago with the Olympics. The Olympics logo was almost a direct copy from the logo that was created like as a finalist like 16 years ago for the Olympics. I mean, a really close copy of it. The artist was like, wait a minute, this is stamped from 2010 and in 2020, you're trying to do a very similar thing. I didn't win the design and now you're taking my design and you're kind of modifying it, that person won. They actually had to modify the logo after they started printing all of the material for the Olympics and changed the brand. I mean, we're talking, there was merchandising with that logo on it. I mean, they had started using it. The designer was like, eh, eh, eh. I created that thing 15 years ago and now you've modified it slightly and you're using it. It does happen. I'm not gonna lie and not say that it does happen, but a digital stamp, is a really good way to show ownership. So never save over top of something you created if you make a new version of it because the old version is the original stamp to when you created the design. So it's your property, it's your ownership. Are you gonna argue over sometimes because it's more battle expense wise, but you can certainly screenshot it and say, hey, I would prefer you didn't use that because remember when I created that and it was kind of, you know, sharing some thoughts with you, you went and turned around and created something very similar. You know, I would appreciate being paid for my work because you're starting to modify something I created originally. So we're not mailing back to each other anymore, but we are digital stamping it. So this class needs to have a portfolio folder made that you put everything in, even if it's past projects that you're making new additions to because you want the original time stamp of the original time you created that project. Because the creative part of it was created way back in the day. You're just making technical creative adjustments to it based on your skill set now. So the out of the book 1.10 is the compilation of your logo applied to swag. In essence, it's page two and three in your book. Remember, page one is your cover page. We're not going to touch that to the end. And you can actually see, this is pretty cool. This is one of the students' designs for their personal logo. And look how they made the shirt with spilled paint. 
and kind of put their logo on it. They have their hat. They use kind of the same texture. And you're going to notice this background graphic. That's actually the very last project we do when we brand our portfolio at the end of this session is to create the cover page and create background elements for each of our case studies. So you'll actually see in the videos I recorded, a lot of the designs have background details. If you're inspired during the individual build process, you can put a space holder in there if there's something you really feel like would go well. But our last assignment is to design the cover page and any background elements we wanna include in our design. So 1.10 is your portfolio PDF, blank page one, page two, your logo, page three, your logo applied to real world applications. And you're gonna notice that as we build our portfolio, that's the process. The even pages will be the artwork. The odd pages will be the real world visualization of the artwork. So if we're creating a logo for a flower shop, the left page or the even page would be the logo design, the concept. The odd page would be the logo design on a bag, the logo design on a sign outside the shop, or the logo design on the vehicle that delivers the flowers, right? The even pages will be artwork and the odd pages will be the real world visualization. Think of Duffy's, that whiskey, the label, in that case study would be the even page on that web page, and the label on the bottle would be the odd page. So Duffy does a really great job. They show you the artwork, the label designed by itself, and they show you the real world application of the logo, the logo label on the bottle. So that's the same conceptual format of our portfolio. Artwork on the left pages, real world application on the right pages. And we're gonna start one case study at a time. We don't even have to look past personal identity because week one, this is a hard nut to crack. Students struggle with that because they're not sure. If you're creating your personal logo and you wanna share it with me before you go too far down the road of developing it, please send me a PDF, send me a screenshot, a JPEG, send me a sketch email me something that shows me the direction you're thinking of going before you go, if you feel really uncomfortable with kind of what you're thinking. This personal brand sets the stage of the entire portfolio. And like I said, my brand has changed twice. I was New York Street NYS design for the probably the first th two or three years of my professional career. It started in co college. Ever since then, the last 20 plus years, I've been Maven Graphics. And so it does evolve and change, but we need to start with something. And that something is a personal brand that feels like you. And I can't tell you what that means because it needs to feel like you, but I can help you from a design standpoint, direct you in what works and doesn't work if you need a little feedback as that process starts. Start with brainstorming, start with some sketches maybe if that's how you work and kind of evolve from there. If you're sharing thoughts with me, please share them in black and white. I don't care about color. If it doesn't work in black and white, I don't care if you put a rainbow in it. It's not gonna work if it doesn't work in black and white. Some of you may have been in design for a little bit. You've already been thinking about this. Well, I already have a name or I've always been, I've already been, trying to do something or think about something, it's a great place to start. If you need direction as we get going, please reach out to me. Everything starts with the self-assessment, the dream job paper to get focused for dream scenarios, things you dream to do someday. And everybody has dreams. I have dreams too. I want to hit the lottery, right? Everybody has dreams. So start with those two things before you dive into portfolio development. This week, self-assessment, dream job paper, 10 classified job posts, and answer the questions on the 10 jobs, and your personal logo. If you don't actually get to personal logo on swag, it's not a deal breaker. We need the personal logo in order to create swag. And swag means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I like to drink coffee, so I'm making a personal logo. I'm putting it on a coffee mug because I can envision myself holding the coffee, right? 
we want to get to there this week. This thing is going to snowball. Once you get comfortable with the format, you're going to start making things pretty quickly, I think. And we'll be able to check off the box and get to five, six, seven case studies and a cover page very quickly by the end of the session. It goes very quickly, but it all starts with these three elements, self-assessment, dream job paper, and personal identity mark or personal branding. If you need a little help, a really good exercise for personal branding is to write down 10 to 15 characteristics of you. What makes you you, right? Because that's what a personal brand is. What makes you, I'm athletic, uh, I'm creative, uh, I like to draw, right? 10 or 15 characteristics. And if you take two of those characteristics and you write them on a piece of paper and you write down visuals that relate to those characteristics. So let's say like athletic and you write um, heartbeat and you write um, uh, running shoes and you jot down 10 things that visually describe those two characteristics. We call this creative cross-referencing. So if I did athletic and artistic, I could do heartbeats and running and I could do all the things that relate to me as athletic weightlifting, like all of these things. And if I do a uh, creative and I can do a mouse and a paintbrush and drawing, I could take elements from those two lists and put together what we call a dichotomy icon, which means an image from one list and an image for another list. And I put it together and it becomes a thing. It becomes a pictograph. It becomes an image or an icon, right? So you can take things you like and even though they might not be like things, you can create a personal brand from those things. So I've had lots of students do different things in that direction when they're doing a personal brand. Uh, I've had other students say, I really love butterflies. So I'm gonna make my last name and put a butterfly landing on one of the letters and I'm gonna write graphic designer under it. That's okay too, right? I'm just trying to give you different ideas of how to brainstorm, do creative listing, write lists, do word searches, do things that may inspire you so that you come up with something that you can use to start with. It can be replaced later as you evolve as a designer, but you need something to kind of get the ball rolling. If you need a little feedback, make sure you email me so that I can give you some feedback. But don't ask me for feedback till you submit your self-assessment and your dream job paper, because I want you to do those things first so that you maybe get inspiration to help you with the personal branding and development of your portfolio. You might have some really great ideas and then you do the dream job paper and you realize stylistically creating a guy, a skull face with a tattoo on the eye socket with the name Death Design, maybe isn't a great idea for personal branding if you wanna work at Hallmark or you wanna do something like that. But if you wanna work in the mu music industry, that might be really great branding for a portfolio that you're hoping to be in an edgy environment like that. I've always leaned towards just being creative, coming up with something fun, creative, not offensive, just something clever. And that would fit in the industries that I was interested in, right? I worked in an ad agency. Then I started working in corporate America at Pepsi. It was things I'd like to do. Ad agencies are awesome because you're doing a different project every single day and they let you come in your shorts and a t-shirt and just be creative. And I brought my dog most days. It was really awesome. Um, but that's a different thing. So I just wanted to showcase in my portfolio that I was creative. I had lots of typography solutions. I was really thoughtful with how I wrote things. Like I knew that that would be important for an agency. And they're going to show you that in their job description. Creativity, teamwork, aptitude for stuff right? They're going to put that in their job description. So that is our week one. This is an hour and 20 minute, almost hour and 30 minute lecture. I try to stay in that window and portfolio because I want to give you as much time as possible to just work on stuff. At this level, 2000 level portfolio, end of the associates, basically two year kind of curve. Everyone has technical ability. Everyone can use the software. And I'm very comfortable with how you design. Now we want to package this thing thoughtfully. So you need to take the time now to be thoughtful in your designs. Please send me JPEGs or PDFs as you evolve so I can see what you're thinking in your direction. I'm going to know it by the dream job paper and the self-assessment. So if you submit those first, I'm going to read those before I ever see personal identity stuff. And that way, if I think maybe, hey, did you think about this? 
What about this color choice? Because it works really well in the industry you're thinking about. This color palette works really well. These textures work really well. This typography works really well. I can help you shape it from there, but start with self-assessment, start with dream job, and then go to personal identity. I haven't turned on learning module two. I haven't turned on learning module three, and I haven't turned on learning module four because it's critical when you're producing a portfolio that you just start with yourself first, not thinking about any other case studies, any other projects, anything like that. Start with you first. Build something that you are happy with. Build something that you are inspired by. After that, all the other pieces fall together. And we'll see it evolve and we'll see your skill set evolve and we'll see what you do well and some things that you might need to strengthen. All that happens in the case study development, but the personal identity starts first. So let's make sure we do a really good job with that. Remember, PDFs are best for submission because they load beautifully. We can see them in Canvas. You can see them when you upload it and see if it's exactly what you want it to look like. And it gives us the closest representation of Duffy.com's case studies on the web. Because if you post a PDF or a JPEG, it loads in the content area Canvas so you could see what it would look like if it was a case study on a website. Because if you are moving into 3,000 and 4,000 level portfolios, we start taking these interactive PDF case studies and we start building what you see on Duffy, which is really thoughtful, HTML driven, full page case studies. But those are more detailed, they're more involved and they take more skill set to do. So the interactive PDF is a really compact, beautiful thing. And you can also share it with people very easily for that entry level job that you're looking for, whether you're in school or you're just getting out of school. So I'm going to end this recording because it's an hour and a half. And this is the time to start dream job, self-assessment, and then personal identity. I can't wait to see what you do every semester, every student. It's always different. It's always unique. I always love it. I always love the creative director position that I'm in where I get to coach you and critique you and push you to be the best you because I want you to get the dream job, right? I want you to be inspired every single day when you go to work because I am. I love it. Even though I teach full time, I have a design business on the side and I'm always doing design and I love it. Sometimes it's pro bono. Sometimes somebody just needs something. I'm like, it takes me five minutes. I'll just make it for you, right? Sometimes it's paid. Sometimes it's a, a barter system. Hey, I really need to update my menu for the restaurant. I own. And I was like, all right, give me a couple hundred bucks in gift cards and I'll do it. And my wife and I can eat there a few times, right? I still do it because I love it. And so hopefully we build a portfolio that gets you off on the right foot so you start doing things that you love. Too many times I see students go through a design program, they get a degree in it, and the first experience they have isn't the best. They got a mean boss. They don't really like the projects they're on. The team's kind of mean, right? And then they start stepping back from it a little bit. You're in the program because you're creative. Maybe you just like the arts. Maybe there's just something you're really passionate about that is design related. So we want to make sure the portfolio gets you off on the right foot so that you're inspired and you create some really cool things. Uh, let's try to stay in pace. So I don't want to see anything from learning module two, three, anything until I see your personal identity. So even if you're struggling on the personal identity, you're like, well, week two, we're doing this. So I'm just going to create this. It's hard to build a portfolio that has a feel without the personal identity first. So really it is the first thing. And if it takes you two weeks to do that, take two weeks to do it because everything is based stylistically on what your style is. And that's represented in a, a personal identity mark. So, all right, I'm gonna end the chat. Everyone have a great week. Let's hit the ground running. Let's create some cool things. I get super inspired in this class because it lets me be the creative director. So I get to really kind of say, try this, push this, do this. And so in the end, we create some really beautiful things. Every portfolio class, we, I'm always super happy with the, what the portfolios are at the end. They're really a great representation. And when I show them to other people, they're always blown away. My gosh, one of your students did that? That's like super awesome. And sometimes you don't think it's super awesome, but the people that don't know how to do it, it's super awesome, right? People that don't know how to do what we do are always blown away. When I have students work on nonprofit stuff and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe what your students created. They're really blown away because they can't do it. It's like when my CPA does my taxes. I'm always blown away because I'm not a tax guy. I just work and pay bills. And so when they do it and they get me money back, I'm like, you're a genius. Like, I don't know how you do it, but I love you for it, 
right? So just remember everyone has an appreciation for what we do. So let's put the best foot forward that we can. All right, have a good night. Have a good week, everyone. Bye.